Welcome everyone to another Scholar Spotlight. Today we have another special scholar who is joining us. Angel, could you please introduce yourself, tell us your name, and then the university you're attending. Sure. Um, so hello, everyone. My name is Angel Wu, and I'm an undergrad uh, law student at the University of Hong Kong and now moving from my second year to third year of studies. And I was a late law scholar last year um, when I completed my late law research and also um, did the late law leadership in action project. Um, so I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to share my stories or any insights with you all today. Awesome. We're excited to hear your story. So can you kind of tell us a bit about your research? What's the title of it? And kind of what is the real world impact of your research? Sure, of course. So um, the research I did as part of the late law project or as the main part of the late law project is about the also accords. Um, the also accords is an agreement that was signed between the Palestinian Liberation Organization and Israel um, in the 1990s. Um, it was a series of seven agreements and one letter. Um, and this is a huge um, watershed moment in history, especially in the uh, contemporary history of Palestine, because this set of agreements um, set out a framework that basically informed the current situation of Palestine um, and the way things have been in the past 30 years um, since the signing of the Oslo Accords. So uh, my research focuses um, on the legal and institutional um, framework of that was set down by this um, by the Oslo Accords and how its compliance and non-compliance um, informs the situation of Palestine nowadays. So in other words, um, the research was an interdisciplinary research um, that covered history, politics, and law. Um, and it the main, I think the main um takeaway from the research would be in, in a nutshell the way that the Oslo Accords were complied with and the way that the Oslo Accords were not complied with um, set the tone of Palestine today. So certain parts of the Oslo Accords that worked um, very well for Israel to impose its control over the Palestinian people um, remained in place largely in Palestine today. However, certain parts of the accords, which were meant to provide safeguards for Palestinian people, um, especially from a human rights perspective, those were largely eroded. Um, and other provisions that are meant to be steps in building a Palestinian future are also eroded. So through analyzing compliance and non-compliance, my research aims to show that the institutional framework in the past in Palestine today is complex in the sense that it is a design by nature um, for Israeli control to be legitimized. Um, and I think this definitely helps understand better understand the situation of Palestine today, um, especially I guess the past um nine months have been a very crucial time for Palestinians. Um, the world's attention has also focused a lot on Palestine over the past nine months. So I think um, this work comes at a very coincidental timing. And I hope really that um, my work helps people understand better the situation. Um, and it also personally helps me build a strong foundation for my understanding of Palestine. And that has helped me um, develop my own personal journey and um, other work after I finished this research um, further. Wow. Yeah, I was going to ask you how your research has kind of evolved in today's climate um, with everything that's happening currently. So that's very interesting that yeah, 
you happen to study it and then, or it happens to have that as your research focus. And then, you know, we're in today's climate where the situation is happening. Um, so where did your passion for this research originate? Like, how did you personally get involved with this or how did you decide to study this? Um, so I personally went to Palestine two years ago. Mm. I spent half a year there and I was a volunteer in a refugee camp in Bethlehem in the West yeah. Bank. Um, and I was actually quite an unconventional volunteer because I wasn't just providing humanitarian assistance, but I was actually a teacher. I taught English and ballet. Um, oh. Another that that's an interesting aspect because I used to study ballet professionally even in Russia. Oh, nice. Um, so ballet is my greatest love, and um. At that time, my main thought was I wanted to share my love of ballet with um, people who are less privileged than I was because I was able to study in my dream school in Russia after um, a lot of hard work. When I was mm -hmm. um, in Hong Kong, I auditioned myself and I was accepted to um, the Bolshoi Ballet Academy in Russia. Oh. So I felt very fortunate. But I also wanted to do more than only pursue my dream. So that was that was what brought me to Palestine initially. Um there was a there was a Dafka group, which is a Palestinian folk dance group, who invited me there as a ballet teacher. So um I went and I also um started volunteering to teach English as well because there was also a school nearby. So I spent half a year in Palestine and those six months, I would say is absolutely life-changing because um, I've never been to the Middle East before. And I guess a lot of people would also um, say that they have a certain impression of the Middle East from the news on the headlines, which I think is quite inevitable when every day um, war and conflict is going on. Mm -hmm. But after going there, I would say that on one hand, I felt the situation on the ground a lot more deeper than anyone who has never been there. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like not just another people struggle, but it also feels like part of me, even though I'm not Palestinian by blood. I saw how my host family um, in Palestine struggled on a day-to-day -day basis, even though they're already not... Um, they had like they they're they're not like um in Gaza for instance or they haven't borne the brunt of the oppression but I would say that um every Palestinian is severely oppressed by Israel um because of the way that the system currently in the occupied territories is um and it doesn't take um I guess it doesn't really take too much for us any foreigner to be able to go there and feel the cause, um, the way things are, the oppression, the occupation. Um, I also see that in my students who are basically kids and the oppression in Palestine reflects a lot on kids because they have um, severely less opportunities um, than anyone else um, in a free place would. And also that, um, I guess, a lot of what I personally saw in Palestine have fueled a passion for me to study deeper about Palestine. Mm -hmm. um, upon returning to Hong Kong, I read up a lot about Palestine, its history, and I also did um, a course in university about the history of the Middle East, well, contemporary history of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So that built the foundation, um, I would say foundational understanding for me and coupled with my personal experience in Palestine. I think um, these two really made me very dedicated to Palestine as a whole. Um, yeah. And just to make it more, I guess to make, to make it more easy to imagine, um, I'm someone who, all my friends say, on a day-to-day -day basis, I talk about Palestine every day, all the time. 
Mm -hmm. um, I tell everyone about it. Um, and not only just one perspective of it, but I tell people so many different faces of Palestine. It's people, the happiness, um, yes. the positivity, the strength, the resilience. The current situation is like, and what my understanding of Palestine is on a professional or academic level. So um, I would say that it is part of me. Um, and I'm very lucky that through late law, through the program, I have the opportunity to conduct a research into a topic that I feel so strongly about. Yeah, that's amazing. That's incredible to hear. And just like, even just the origin of how you connected through ballet and through your passion and how that evolved. So what has been the biggest challenge that you've encountered in your research, especially because you are in such a unique position at such a pivotal point in history? Um, so yeah, how what's been the biggest challenge that you've encountered so far? So I would say that um, the biggest challenge I've encountered in my research is probably something that is shared by a lot of um, academic scholars or even advocates um, about Palestine. Um, the emotional side of things, I guess, um, is something that most people don't see because mm -hmm. academic um, scholars are trained to write in a very professional way and to be very analytical about um, the system, especially when uh, you work in fields of like law or politics. Um, it's our job to analyze and as as a junior researcher, I would say um, that's something that I came into the late law program thinking I would um, learn more about and also like hone my skills in 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 terms of um, these. Uh, I would say these these skills that like a lot of um, academics or scholars have, mm -hmm. but the ability to very critically and analytically approach um, a topic like Palestine also makes it hard for someone who feels very strongly about it. Um, one, I guess, one, one coping mechanism, if I may call it, or just one way um, this challenge is eased is by doing the research itself because um, I'm doing this for the Palestinian cause and for in part expressing um, my interest in Palestine and also as a way for me to contribute to the cause and also to inform more people about it. Um, and this is this would also be clearly stated in the research as um, a per one of the important purposes of this research. Um, it's not a detached research where um, this is just any topic I could choose, but there's a very strong reason and personal reason behind it. Um, but in the meantime, it is also difficult to bear with the, I would say the feelings of seeing um, a people you care so much about, a place you care so much about um, in historical lenses, because you, no one would understand more than um, a researcher on this topic that the ways Palestinians have been oppressed is very systematic and especially coinciding with um, October 7th and the situation, the onslaught that evolved uh, afterwards. I think um, at that time I was still in the process of working, finalizing my work. And I would say that that has a huge impact on me. And also my supervisor, um, who is from Gaza herself, but she mm. is um, a lecturer in Scotland in the University of St. Andrews. Um, oh. I would say that that period has been almost devastating, but definitely mm. devastating for everyone who cares deeply about Palestine and even has like friends or family in there so it took like it literally took a while for me to process it or even for my supervisor 
um, to process it. And she has even lost family in Gaza. Um, so I think, I think the the emotional um, burden yeah. of researching and writing about Palestine is one of like the greatest challenges that come with this research or this study. Yeah. And how do you, I guess you mentioned that you focus on the research in order to kind of help overcome that and kind of the um, ways in which it's going to, you know, kind of serve as a form of activism or like your activism for the cause. But how do you, I guess, handle your mental state in the midst of it? Like, what do you do to, yeah, make sure that your mental health is is okay and that your emotional health of yourself and those around you? Um, or specifically yourself? Yeah, that's definitely a, an important question because it's a life lesson for us. Um, yeah. I think for also like many people who are working on very difficult causes, um, not only the Palestinian cause, but a lot of other human rights causes. Mm -hmm. um, the answer is that there's no perfect answer because we're always in the process of figuring it out. But what I can say is at the end of the day, it boils down a lot to hope because um, even though hope is an inherently elusive thing, it's very hard to conceptualize and you simply have to have hope um, to pull yourself through all of this. Um, I think it's the only way that a lot of us can resort to um, because when working on a very difficult topic that you realize historically this people has been systematically oppressed and there isn't really an immediate way out for them. Mm -hmm. The only way is to believe that in the long term, all the efforts of the people who are working on this now is going to come uh is going to evolve into something. Um and it's a very difficult question because um most of us I mean it would be very hard for anyone to define even a solution for mm -hmm. the situation of Palestinians. But in in difficult situations like this, I think definitely um hope is something very important for us to cling on to. Mm -hmm. And I guess part of it is also seeing the strength of people. Mm -hmm. um, when you see that people can be very resilient and strong, you have some hope that um, things will eventually be better one day. And if you see, for example, incremental progress in your own work, um, oh. for instance, like, every single person I speak to means one more person who is um, who has learned about Palestine and who is aware about the injustice, then I think it is these like incremental small steps that um, fuel me every single day to move on um, in a work like this. And lastly, I would also say that um, in the end of the day, like, hope is not itself sufficient uh, mm. and real change do need to come and so it would really be like a combination of work and hope I guess yeah that's yeah very powerful honestly and like you said it's not just within your specific research but anyone mm -hmm. focusing on human so rights and just mm -hmm. social impact can be very it can be very emotionally rough for many people. And so, yeah, um, appreciate the work that you're doing on this. Uh, so kind of pivoting a bit, what would you say is the most memorable moment from your laid law scholarship experience so far? I think the most memorable moment is definitely um, part of my leadership in action project or the whole of it, if I may say, because that was a very special experience. Um, I planned it myself and with the approval of the Horizons office, um, which was administrating the laid law program at D 
the University of Hong Kong, um, I managed to um, travel to Lebanon and work with a local NGO for two months. Mm. Um, and I did a lot of different things during that period. Um, I interacted a lot with um, the beneficiaries that this organization was um, working with. Uh, so most of them are refugees, um, displaced people, stateless people and migrant workers as well. So the work of the organization focuses very much on providing legal support to um, marginalized populations or vulnerable populations in Lebanon, mm. um, including Palestinians as well, but also like uh, other, for, for instance, Syrian refugees or mm. stateless people, foreign migrants. Um, what was really memorable from this experience is how oh, oh. I saw things happen on the ground, I would say, because um, Lebanon is a much deeper environment than where I came from, Hong Kong. Um, in Hong Kong, we're quite accustomed to a very developed legal system in many ways. But um, Lebanon was, uh, especially in last year or in the past few years, the economy has been really in a difficult situation. The political situation is very difficult as well. Um, the legal system of Lebanon also has a lot of room for huge room for improvement in that, um, especially when it comes to the rights of the marginalized populations. So basically working in a really imperfect system is quite interesting because you would think of a lot of, like you would have realized that a lot of what we take for granted as rights um, in more progressive or developed societies are not necessarily immediately available or naturally available in many cases. Mm. And a lot of that um, comes through hard work and advocacy. So for instance, um, I work a lot on statelessness in Lebanon. So that is when people don't have a passport, um, they don't have nationality, which may come as very weird to a lot of us because um, especially in Hong Kong, where I come from, um, mm -hmm. everyone has, you know, almost everyone has like a birth certificate easily and a passport easily just by virtue of being born in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. I guess like in a lot of developed countries, it may also never occur to people that um, there might be people who have huge difficulties obtaining a passport or a nationality, which means the right to exist in one place. Um, mm -hmm. And so working on topics like this, for instance, like statelessness, that was really interesting. And it makes it makes you reflect very deeply on, the, on everything in, in daily life. Like, things that you take for granted very easily it can be actually very different for others and I think it is really the amount of thought that the experience has provoked makes it truly wonderful. nice that's amazing um wow okay so can you briefly describe a future that you are striving to create um I would say that I'm striving very much for a future where Palestine is a free place. That's a mm. short answer, but um, in essence, it means, um, first of all, like for it to happen, Palestinian voices are being valued and taken seriously on the global level. Um, and the situation in Palestine must be address the systematic um, oppression must be dismantled and um, Palestinians must be seen as human um, and accorded with um, all the rights and dignity and respect that come for human beings. Um, it's a very long way to go for advocates or um, human rights defenders to achieve this cause. But um, I think, yeah, that's a very long-term future. Um, if I were 
to yeah. answer this question. But then I think on on the other hand also what it means is um this future that I hope I'm part like I'm contributing towards is also a mirror of the larger uh, like like the world in general. Um, mm -hmm. Palestine is not only the place where oppression happens, um, nor the only place where conflict is going on. There are a lot of other wars still going on um, in Ukraine and other parts of the Middle East, like Syria and Yemen and in Africa as well. Um, and human rights violations are happening around the globe, um, regardless of, like even in places that are not in conflict right now. Yeah. So I would say that um, it is probably a life cause because these uh, a lot of these changes don't come within a day. And we really, really hope to see um, better progress in the future. Yeah. But then I would say um, if I have a vision for the world, it is definitely where all human beings are treated as humans um, and at least have fundamental rights, if not like, if not for all the human rights that each of us should have. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful vision. And I guess I, I'm curious just from hearing what, you're, what you've spoken about so far, like do you have a, I guess a specific career in mind that you wanna go into or are you still working that out? No pressure or anything. I'm <laughs> just curious. I'm hoping for a career in the nonprofit sector or in non-governmental organizations, basically, or, or human rights organizations in, in their sense. And I have, like, I have a focus for that. Um, I'm developing a focus in the Middle East, like the region. And I'm hoping eventually that I will be working in this region because this is the place I like a lot. Yeah. Having been to Palestine and Lebanon, um, despite the all the difficulties of this region, it's a very beautiful place with beautiful people. Um, and I really love the work of human rights advocacy, research, casework, um, even just assistance. I think. Yeah. I would be going into hopefully this field um once I graduate but I wouldn't have like very specific organizations at all. um I think so far I yeah. really like working with local organizations that's probably worth mentioning because when when it comes to human rights work um what mm -hmm. immediately comes to mind to a lot of people well, are international organizations especially the UN UN agencies yeah um the red cross or other ngos um i would say that if i you know if i were to describe a direction for myself i'm looking more at local ngos because that's actually where a lot of work is really being done wow. on the immediate level or on the local mm -hmm. level um it is often in local ngos that you have the most opportunity to interact with the people you're working for and where you would truly be able to understand them on you know on the same level and on and truly be able to provide as far as possible like the support or assistance that they need so I find like I find a lot of purpose and meaning in working at local NGOs. Um, yeah. So I hope this is what I could do in the future. Yeah, I don't see why not. You're doing an amazing job, like really connecting on the ground with people and in the communities. I feel like that's something that has really driven my passion as well. And I completely feel you on this um, aspect of the value of like the localized like a locally contextualized view of these issues are so, it's just so vital. Um, and oftentimes, like you said, these big organizations are glamorized, but oftentimes it's the local organizations that are really like pushing hard and talk to the people every single day. And like, yeah, so very inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. 
So now we're going to kind of pivot to a a lighter, uh, quick fire, rapid question uh, answer. So I'm going to ask you a few questions and I want you to just say whatever pops to mind first. Are you ready? <laughs> All right. What is your anthem? What is the, the song that you listen to to get you in the mood or whatever, you know, makes your day? Um, I really love the song uh, called Do You Hear the People Sing? So it's like mm. from the musical um, Smith's uh And oh. it, yeah, it's a really uplifting in an encouraging way because it and it sounds like really grand um and also the the i i think the the title basically explains everything do you hear the people yeah. say so do you hear the people's voices um are things being done um for the people i think that's something i personally quite believe in so that's why like that would be my anthem if I can yeah talk. resonates with you wow nice i've all I, I've actually wanted to watch that musical because it's a musical, right? Like the entire, yeah. Situation. yeah, yeah. I've been seeing signs around London and I'm like, I need to go watch that. Um, So yes, I'm adding that back to my list. What are you currently binging on TV? Or you can say a movie that you just watch over and over again. Or if you don't watch TV currently, then no worries. We understand that you're a busy person. <laughs> I haven't watched movies in a long time. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so what is your top book recommendation? Um. Okay, so most recently I was reading um a book called We Have No uh We Have No Friends But the Mountains. Mm, I think what is it about? We, so it's about the Kurdish people. Kurdish okay. people are basically people who are um, spread across Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. Um, Kurdistan is not yet a country, but it's, for instance, it's a region in Iraq, and um, mm. it's also a region in Syria. Like, it's an autonomous region in Iraq, and it's a, mm. an autonomous the Kurdish autonomous region in Syria is called Rojava. Um, there are a lot of Kurds in Turkey as well, and um, a lot of Kurdish people in Iran. This is like, um, Kurdish people are like uh, another people who have a very long line calls um, for their own country, hopefully one day. Mm. Um, so they've also come across come through like a lot of difficulties historically and um the phrase uh we have no friends but the mountains is essentially um a very common phrase around uh, amongst Kurdish people because they are a mountain people and they have uh hmm. fought a lot of um foreign enemies before like other countries neighboring countries that have been oppressing them for decades and decades um they find comfort and they find belonging in the mountains uh, which is basically um most of what comprise these regions of Kurdistan where Kurdish people live it's a lot of mountains hills um it is a symbol of belonging and identity and also mm -hmm. resistance um so I'm trying to learn about these different causes, a lot of different causes, um, similar or like, and trying to compare and contrast them with, for instance, the passing cause that I have worked so much on. Mm -hmm. Nice. Do you have a podcast obsession? In? Oh. And if so, which one? I watch... Sorry, I, I I listen to Al Jazeera's podcast sometimes oh, just okay. to get the weekly news. Um, but actually, something I like is to watch or listen to podcasts in different countries. So there's a mm. podcast I really like, but then it's from Lebanon. Um, it's called Sardi, and they talk about Lebanese politics mostly, but also like global trends, um, stuff like that. 
Okay, and I'm gonna have to at the school books. It's called Saturday After Dinner on YouTube. Saturday After Dinner. Okay. And um, down. I think what is really interesting is it's essentially um in Arabic and they have English subtitles. Um, okay. On one hand, like it's a chance for me to learn more Arabic. But I think what's most interesting is because like when you try to take a look at podcasts from different countries and different places, you see how people actually think alike. Um, like people from different places may think like you or mm. there may be um, some differences in the ways things are perceived. Um, oh. And yeah, like it's also fun. It's really what he has all. Um, so I think it's a very nice way of learning about other countries. Um, or yeah. just like feeling the people because the way a podcast is run in another country says a lot about the culture, um, the norms and the customs, the common phrases that people use. So I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, you know, that's how I felt when I watched the news for the first time outside of the U.S. because I'm from Houston, Texas originally. And I traveled a lot as a child. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to like travel to different places. My family's from Nigeria and Jamaica. And so I would travel to those places or to Jamaica often and to England. But as an adult traveling in undergraduate um, for the first time, and watching the news in a different country for the first time, I was just like, wow, this is such a different perspective of the same issues oftentimes, but just a different perspective on the same things. And it was just like, wow, this is blowing my mind. So I think like that's when I started making a point of being very intentional to not just go to the same news channels that I would get in the U.S. in a different country, but actually look at the local news, the like just like just really try to get the the local context because it does it expands your perspective so much. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's really cool. Can you share something that made you feel joy recently? Yeah, sure. So um, uh, recently, my family, um, like a few weeks back, my family found a stray cat on the street, um, mm. and. She was really tiny at the time. Like yeah. she's barely, you know, like you can you can hold her in your two hands. Um, I think a few weeks old. Aww. And but then she was really skinny and she was mm -hmm. looking very lonely on the streets that day. Mm -hmm. Um and my family picked her up and took her home. Aww. Initially in the few first few days, mm -hmm. uh she wasn't doing perfectly well because mm -hmm. she might have been too fragile for a long time. Mm -hmm. um we had to do like checkups with with the vet and she also had to take medication mm -hmm. but by now um she's a healthy growing little cat and Aww. she has like energy um she just bounces around the house and she's just really cute like she just so cute it's all of our love um I think yeah so that I mean, seeing her recover oh, and also grow, start to grow, is definitely mm -hmm. really bringing a lot of joy. Right. And, mm -hmm. and I guess like difficult times because yeah, it's life and it's it's hope, you know, like it's energy. Yeah. Um, and you see like a little cat jumping up and down in the house. I think it just brightens brightens yeah. things immediately. And um, yeah, I guess also like. It makes you feel that things are actually um, quite simple sometimes. Uh, yeah. Like you can see very little things and feel happy already. Um, and also it reminds like us of how there's always like some joy to be found in life, like daily life mm. around you. Um, yeah. That's beautiful. Honestly, there's always some joy to be found around you in life. Yes. That is such a, a nice ending. And honestly, I'm going to have to say this. I am obsessed with cat videos on YouTube and Instagram. Like my explore page is literally nothing but kitten videos and puppies. And so I'm just like, <laughs> it just brings so much joy. And I used to never be this person. But I don't know if 2024, that year just like it was needed in my life. So <laughs> I completely understand. I can only imagine if I actually saw 
a kitten in person playing around. Um, but yeah, that's really beautiful. Thanks for sharing. Is there anything that you'd like to plug before we go? Um, any cause or an NGO that you'd like to shout out that you're passionate about? passionate about statelessness as I just mentioned that's not people who don't have um a nationality it can be that they they belong to a people that does not have a nation so for example like Palestinians um it can also be that they're simply from a place a country but for whatever reason for instance like procedural difficulties or legal issues they are unable to get their passport um or they've been um stripped of nationality as a whole group like for instance rohingya people mm -hmm. um this is a cause that i'm quite passionate about and after working on it in lebanon last year as part of the leadership in action project um I continue to work on it. Um, for instance, lately, I have been helping online with um, an organization or a network that researches statelessness across the Asia Pacific. Um, so this is a cause that I'm personally quite interested in. And I'm also hoping in the coming years to investigate into it, like to explore mm -hmm. it further. Um, other... Other things going on is that um, this summer I'm also traveling around the Middle East amidst very tricky, tough times. Mm -hmm. um, and currently I'm in Kurdistan in Iraq. So I was going to ask Kurds you where you were. Yeah. Yeah. The the autonomous region um, mm. for the Kurdish people in Iraq. Oh, and okay. I'm working with a local NGO here now as well. And um. I'm continuing my path that the late law program has really put me on. Um, and I'm really excited because step by step, I'm building up um, different opportunities, different experiences, learning a lot of new things um, and exploring a lot of new places. Um, mm -hmm. I think... I think yeah, I'm. I I've definitely been really blessed by the late law program, um, because it it was a huge um it was a huge step I guess to um start help help me start building my path, and now I'm currently working on it, and developing myself in the areas that I'm interested in. So I think yeah, um, I guess. That could be, um, that is what I've been up to lately. And yeah. I hope that's interesting. Yeah, that's absolutely interesting. Thank you so much for like taking the time out of your day. I know that you are, you have a lot going on. You're traveling around the Middle East and working on a lot of different causes uh, alongside your research, like you said, with the NGO. So thank you for, for taking the time to chat today. And for sharing your story and being so vulnerable and sharing like, you know, your personal connections to, to your research. So thank you so much. And it's been a very inspiring conversation. So I'm super excited to just share this with the world. And thank you all who have sat and watched the Scholar Spotlight. We are so happy to have had Angel today and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Angel. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>